started. Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Today's speaker is Professor Zilin Jiang from Arizona State University. Dr. Jiang earned his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2016 under the guidance of Boris Buch. After that, he held postdocs at Technion and MIT. He has been at Arizona State since January and is now an assistant professor. Dr. Jiang is an expert in discrete geometry and its interactions with graph theory. Today, he will tell us about his recent work involving spherical two distance sets. So please take it away, Zilin. Thank you. Thanks, Joey, for, for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, and also, uh, um, it's my pleasure to share my work on uh, this spherical two distance set and also its connection with sine graphs. Okay, so the story I'm going to tell you is something about, you know, this, uh, some fantastic uh, objects in discrete geometry and how it's connected to, you know, graphs. Um, and I want to say that this is a joint work um, that span um, with, you know, many uh, collaborators that spans um, a couple of years. So, uh, Part of the work is joint. Oops, part of the work is joint with Alexander Polianski, and the paper is you know, posted here. And also, there are two papers with the team at MIT: Jonathan Tido, uh, Yuan Yao, Shen Tong Zhang, and uh, Yu Fei Zhao. So, just to mention that uh, Jonathan, I think, is graduating soon, so will be on the job market. And uh, uh, Yuan Yao, Shen Tong Zhang, they are undergraduate students. So the work are done during a summer uh, undergrad, undergrad research uh, program at MIT. And the Yufei is a professor, um, I think it's an assistant professor at MIT, who's also my mentor uh, when I was a postdoc there. All right, so I'm going to start with the definition of a spherical two distance set. I think, you know, at Kodak seminar, uh, well, perhaps at some point or it's mentioned or maybe some special cases are mentioned, but here's the definition. So for me, a spec uh, spherical two distance set consists of um, points uh, in D dimensional Euclidean space where uh, these points are distance one away from the origin. So and also the pairwise inner product takes only two values, okay? So these two um, conditions explains the name, right? Spherical means that they're you know, on the unit sphere in RD and you only get two uh, kinds of distances, okay? So a general question that can be asked is of this extremal uh, fashion so you want, we want to find the maximum size of a spherical two distance set in RD. So given dimension D, I want to understand the largest spherical two distance set that I can fit into this dimensional space. So let's denote this maximum size by N of D. Okay. And um, yeah, we have two inequalities bounding this um, function of D. Um, and they are, as you can see, they are pretty close to each other. You know, if you only want to think about order of magnitude, they are quite precise, you know, about half of d squared. So for the upper bound, um, which is due to Desert, uh, Goethos, and uh, Seidel, uh, that says it's bounded by half d times d plus three. And the lower bound is, um, not trivial, but you know, if you think about it for a while, you can figure it out. So the example is that you take a properly scaled uh, regular simplex centered at the origin and just take all the midpoints of all the edges in the, in the simplex. Okay? So in D dimensional space, the simplex has, you know, um, D plus one vertices, hence choosing any pair of uh, vertices in the simplex uh, and the you know, you get a midpoint. So in total, you get d plus one choose two many midpoints. And uh, here in the uh, in the picture, I just drew a example for regular 
uh, tetrahedron and you can take the midpoints. Okay, so, uh, so the reason for the lower bound is because of B plus one choose two. And um, at this point, I mean, you could be very happy that, you know, roughly speaking, you get this answer. Um, but we have some further result that's due to Greece and the uh, vision. So they said that actually the lower bound is the truth most of the time, uh, in the sense that whenever D is at least seven, uh, and also um, D is not uh, equal to an odd number squared minus three, uh, if you don't care about this exceptional case, which uh, you know, become rarer and rarer uh, as D becomes larger, then roughly speaking, you know, for almost all D, uh, the lower bound is the, is the best you can do, okay? So, but you know, still over there, there are uh, questions that can be asked. What happens when D is equal to an odd number squared minus three, okay? Um, but that's not the question that I want to focus on. The question that I want to focus on um, is, the following question, right? So what happens if the inner products are fixed? Okay, so this is, here's what I mean. Given two parameters, let's say beta and alpha, and alpha is the larger of the two, um, I can define this uh, function n of d with parameters alpha and beta. And roughly speaking, I write down the similar uh, definitions of uh, n of d. Namely, you know, I want to understand the maximum size of a set of unit vectors. Um, but the catch is that now the two values that the pairwise inner products can take uh, must be either alpha or beta. Okay, so someone give me alpha and beta, and uh, you know, I want to figure out this uh, this function uh, n sub alpha beta of d. So here are some results that we know, and uh, which you know hinted that um, certain kinds of alpha beta are, are more interesting than the others. Okay, so, so new mal first showed the following: for almost all kind of alpha beta, this function is bounded above by two d plus one. So it's quite different behavior than n of d. So remember that without alpha and beta, n of d is roughly half of d squared. But if uh, whenever we specify this alpha and beta to be the inner products, then they're always bounded by 2d plus one, unless we're in the very special case where one minus alpha over alpha minus beta is an integer. Okay. And this number, I want you to, it's not, you know, this expression, one alpha over alpha over alpha minus beta uh, will, uh, will appear repeatedly in the talk. So somehow in, your, in the back of your mind, uh, you should, you know, um, we, will, we, will, we will see this number again and again. Okay, I will remind you about this parameter. And uh, Lama, Rogers, and uh, Sidel also showed the following that you, indeed can get quadratically many such unit vectors with inner product alpha or beta uh, whenever uh, alpha and beta are both non-negative. And also, you know, this special parameter is an integer. Okay. And also there is a simple observation that if the two parameters are all negative, then the number of such unit vectors is bounded above by some constant um, that related to alpha. This is a very general phenomena, uh, phenomena and uh, perhaps a lo lot of people here can show it easily. So um, whenever you have a, a set of unit vectors uh, whose what in the product is bounded from above by alpha, where alpha is less than zero, uh, then you can get this uh, bound on the, on the number of uh, uh, such unit vectors, namely one minus one over alpha. Basically what you do is to write on the gram matrix 
and then the diagonals are all ones and also the off diagonal elements are at most alpha and uh, to in order for it to be uh, positive semi definite you get some inequality and that bounds the size of the of the matrix hence the size of the of the set of unit vectors okay so let me not get into that uh, hopefully people can fill out the details so in view of these three results, let me try to summarize um, what we can say about uh, this function uh, n sub alpha beta of d in a, in a, in the plane. Okay, so so you know, here's a, here's a diagram. So um, the result uh, maybe let's start with the less interesting one. So here if you know, in this triangle, alpha and beta are all negative. Uh, and we know that it's less interesting in the sense that uh, the function n alpha beta of d is bounded by a constant. Okay. Um, and the result um, by uh, Lam, Lam and Roger LRS though um, says that um, here an alpha beta of D could be uh, quadratic in many. Okay. Um, but also here is a here is a result by Bala Drexler Kivash that addresses what happens uh, in this region. Okay. Namely, when alpha is a non negative integer and the beta is negative, oh, sorry, when alpha is a non negative real number and the beta is negative, then we can actually get a linear upper bound on this function. And uh, we get this um, you know, coefficient in front of um, in front of d. Okay, so somehow maybe here you might guess that it's always the case that uh, uh, that this function behaves linearly. And also this, um, this region is interesting because it contains the case where beta is equal to minus alpha, okay? And uh, that case us usually is known as equiangular lines. Okay. Uh, but uh, here, I know that in the seminar, we have seen a couple of times equal angle lines, but perhaps in the in complex space. But uh, in this context, I want to focus on the on the real space, okay, in RD. Okay. So somehow, for me, I want to focus on this region uh, regime of uh, parameters, and in particular, the question I want to ask is the following. So if I fix these two parameters. Uh, beta less than zero, less than equal to alpha, and can I determine precisely, maybe, uh, this function n sub alpha beta of d for all large d? And the reason here usually, you know, we want to focus on large d is because when d is small, there are some exceptional uh, construction that, you know, can break the behavior but somehow as d grows larger and larger, um, the behavior of the function becomes regular in the sense that perhaps one can write down a very simple formula for this, uh, this function n after beta d. And uh, maybe, you know, in certain cases, we can't really pin down the formula for this function. We also, we can uh, ask for less and say, how about figuring out the limit of the ratio between the function and d. In particular, I want to understand if it's uh, a linear function, uh, approximately a linear in d, and if that's the case, 
you know, what's the coefficient, leading coefficient uh, in front of linear coefficient in front of D. Okay. Um, is there any questions before I move on? Is it clear that? Um, yeah, I have a question. Does the limit obviously exist? Uh, that's a good question. It's not clear. I see. But at the very least, we want good upper and lower bounds for, for what that fraction could be. And exactly. maybe you're about to tell us that it does exist. I don't know. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, because, you know, the case where beta is equal to minus alpha, namely the equal angular line case is uh, well studied. So let me start from there and tell you the story uh, over there and how you know the story in equilibrium line would inspire um, certain approaches to this more general two distance set question, two distance set questions. So again, here's the equilibrium line case where beta is equal to minus alpha. The inner products between the unit vectors are either uh, plus alpha or minus alpha. And just to recall uh, this weird parameter that showed up a couple of slides ago. So lambda is one minus alpha over alpha minus beta. And since in this case, minus beta is alpha, so it's the same as one minus alpha uh, over two alpha. Okay. And to state actually the result Actually, in this case, for equal angle lines, we can solve the problem that I that just posed completely, namely, or, you know, to certain satisfaction, depending on how um, strict you ask. Um, and to state the theorem, let me introduce uh, this notion called spectral radius order. So it's something related to graph, and you might be asking why you know it shows up in the uh, in this equiangular line context, and I will talk about that later. So just bear with me. Um, given a number lambda, you can compute this spectral radius order k of lambda, and that is the smallest k such that you can find a k vertex graph G whose adjacency matrix has largest eigenvalue precisely equal to lambda. And uh, my notation for the largest eigenvalue is lambda one of G. Okay. And if, you know, maybe some, someone give you some lambda that's, you know, like, I don't know, pi, then you know that, you know, the largest eigenvalue can never be a transcendental number. So in that case, just set K of lambda equals zero if there is no such graph G, um, okay? Um, so if I can define this number K of lambda, then I can describe precisely this function uh, N alpha beta, you know, in the equal angular line context uh, to very good set, um, precision. Uh, so, Given alpha bigger than zero, and you know you compute this lambda given by this formula of alpha for all d that is sufficiently large enough, namely you know there is some threshold d zero of alpha depending on your alpha, and whenever d exceeds that threshold, the behavior of and alpha minus alpha of D, the maximum size of an equilibrium line with angle alpha is precisely given by this formula, K of lambda times D minus one over K of lambda minus one rounded down. Whenever this spectral radius order is finite. Otherwise it's roughly D. Okay, with some arrow that is of order little o of d. Okay. Although perhaps one can actually reduce this little o of d to some constant. Um, maybe, you know, if one 
want to ask a better answer, maybe there's some uh, improvement that can be made uh, for the case when k of lambda is equal to infinity. Okay. All right, so that's the result is kind of weird, right? So why does this k of lambda pops up in determining the maximum uh, size of the angular line with, you know, parameter alpha? Um, so before I get into the why, let me just show you a couple of examples uh, of this, uh, the theorem, right, special cases. Okay, so these are the definition and the theorem again. And you know, let's think about some special cases of parameter alpha and try to see what the theorem would predict. Right? Uh, so let's think about the case uh, where alpha is one over three. So uh, Recall that here lambda is one minus alpha over two alpha. So in this case, lambda is equal to one. And then you ask yourself, what's the spectral radius of for lambda equals one? Right? What's the smallest graph G whose largest eigenvalue is equal to one? It turns out that you don't need to go too far to find such a graph. And it already exists on a graph with two vertices. So an edge will give you uh, the largest eigenvalue uh, equals one. Okay. And in that case, since this graph has two vertices, k of lambda is equal to two. And roughly speaking, the theorem tells you that the function is uh, 2D, about 2D. So if you only care about, you know, how the linear behavior of this, then, you know, it's K of lambda over K of lambda minus one. So that's two. Okay, so next one, um, maybe I care about the following weird uh, parameter alpha, which is a uh, one over one plus two to two. Plug in the formula when for lambda, you get lambda equals uh, uh, square root of two. Um, and in this case, actually, this graph uh, usually called cherry graph on three vertices uh, and two edges will give you uh, the largest eigenvalue square root of two. And in general, um, if you have a central vertex and with you know, k leaves attached to it, then the largest eigenvalue will be square root of k. Okay, so here k is equal to, so the number of leaves is equal to two, hence the answer, the largest eigenvalue is root two. And in that case, the number of vertices is three and we get 3d over two. Okay, let me give you one last example, one over five. Lambda will be two. Triangle gives you the largest uh, eigenvalue two. In that case, it's still three. Okay, the special radius is still three, and uh, roughly the you know the function uh, n uh, sub alpha minus alpha uh, of d is three d over two again. Okay. All right. So. Okay, so before I move on to tell you why uh, this uh, K of lambda is connected to the behavior of this function, is there any question? Okay, good. So, so let me tell you the connection between the two things, right? So why, you know, somehow, you know, set of univectors in d-dimensional Euclidean spaces connect to graphs. So here's what you do. Um, so a set of equiangular lines in, is just set of vectors 
are d and they are unit vectors and the pairwise inner product is equal to plus minus alpha and the couple of properties we can say about um, the set of vectors is the following. So the gram matrix V i in the product with V j is a PSD matrix. And also the rank of this gram matrix is at most D. So you can actually translate everything about uh, unit vectors to some properties of a graph G. Okay. Uh, here's how, how you get this graph G. Well, the vertex set is precisely the same as uh, you know, the, the, the points in RD. So you take all these points and say, you know, now you are the vertices. Uh, but to formulate a graph, you need to co uh, connect it vertices to form edges. And the rule for that is if the inner product between VI and VJ is equal to minus alpha, okay, so it can be either plus alpha or minus alpha. So when it's negative, I put an edge between VI and VJ. Now you can formulate everything about gram matrix in terms of um, in, term, in terms of the adjacency matrix of this graph G. And so if you say that AG is the adjacency matrix of G, okay, then these two conditions can be translated uh, to certain conditions on the adjacency matrix of G. And namely, what we get is that lambda i minus uh, the adjacency matrix plus half of J. So uh, i is the identity matrix and J is the all one matrix. Should be positive semi-definite. And here again, this lambda is one minus alpha or two alpha. And also the rank of the same matrix is at most D. Okay. Uh, just to feel uh, one remark about how to get this uh, matrix uh, lambda i minus a g plus half of j. Basically, you probably scale the grand matrix, I think, by uh, maybe one over two alpha. Then you will get, uh, so this is roughly a scaled version of uh, the grand matrix. Okay. And actually, you can go back and forth between the two words. So actually, these two are precisely the same question, uh, same, same thing, in the sense that you know, previously, if you are given this D and alpha and try to find the maximal size uh, of equal angle lines in RD with angle alpha, now you can translate that to the following question. So given D and the lambda, and you get lambda by calculating one minus alpha over two alpha, you want to find the largest n vertex graph uh, with two properties. Uh, the first is this PSD prop, uh, property. And the second is this rank property. Okay. Um, so, so far I'm just trying to, you know, translate everything about you know, vectors in RD to properties of, of graphs. Um, okay. 
So here's the goal. We are given Q parameters D and the lambda. The lambda is one minus alpha over two alpha. I want to find the largest graph with these two properties. So let me give you an example, a construction of such a graph. And this construction will show you the connection between the spectral radius order uh, K of lambda with, you know, the, um, with this kind of graph G. Okay. So let's say I'm given this lambda, which is calculated by one minus alpha over two alpha. I can actually find a K vertex graph. So let's try to first find a K vertex graph. Let's call it G zero such that the largest eigenvalue of G zero is equal to lambda. Okay. Um, you know, let's assume this, it's the case that we can find such a graph G zero. For example, you know, when lambda is equal to one, then G zero could just be an edge. Right? The, the largest eigenvalue of an edge is equal to one. Okay, so now how do I construct this, uh, this, um, this graph G? Well, take, G to be disjoint, uh, let's say L copies of G zero. Uh, and uh, here the parameter L is yet to be determined. So we will determine it later. Well, let's try to check the PSD condition. Uh, the PSD condition says that, you know, lambda i minus a g plus half of j should be a PSD matrix. Well, the, we know perfectly well the spectrum or the eigenvalues of this graph g. The largest eigenvalue of g is equal to lambda, and the, you know, according to, okay, so. Let me just say that this graph is also connected. So by, you know, we know that the largest eigenvalue will actually be a simple eigenvalue because G zero is, uh, is, is a connected graph. So this, the eigenvalues of disjoint unions of G zero will have largest eigenvalue, couple of lambdas and with some smaller eigenvalues. And there will be L, uh, the multiplicity of the largest eigenvalue lambda will be L. Then okay. now if you look at the, you know, this, uh, this matrix, lambda I minus AG will be a PSD matrix because the largest eigenvalue of uh, graph G is at most lambda. And the half of J or the matrix J itself is a PSD matrix. Hence the sum is also a PSD matrix. Okay, so that's checked out. And the rank, well, the rank of the, this matrix, then the I minus AG plus half of J, well, that's at most the rank of the first matrix, then the I minus AG plus the rank of the second matrix, half of J, but J is uh, all one matrix. The rank is equal to one, okay? And it's not very hard to figure out the rank of lambda I minus AG, given that you know, you know the spectrum of, uh, of graph G. Okay? It turns out that it's L times K minus one plus one uh, less than or equal to G. D, okay. So, okay, so this is what we want, right? At the end of the day, I want to be able to pick L such that, you know, this upper bound on the rank is at most D, hence the rank condition is satisfied. Therefore, in order to form the largest, um, uh, so, so if you want to form the largest graph G, you better take L to be the largest possible number that you can, so that you satisfy this rank condition. And in particular, you want to take about 
you know, d over k minus one, okay, roughly speaking. Okay. Hence, the total size of G will be uh, K times D over K minus one. And now, as you can see here, that you want K to be as small as possible to have K D over K minus one to be as large as possible. Right? So that's why, you know, at the beginning, you want to take K to be this K of lambda, which is the smallest such K. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, Sorry, here I really want to write something like this. So by this construction, you can see that this function is bounded from below by k of lambda times d over k of lambda minus one plus some constant arrows. Uh, you know, if you can be careful to keep track of this constant arrow and uh, get our the result that I stated before, but you know, if we only care about the symptotic behavior you should be already be very happy with the current construction and the arguments. Okay. And the, you know, the harder part is to prove actually the reverse inequality. Okay. And that's, that actually can be done. Okay. All right, so let's come back to our question that we started with, right? I fix two parameters, alpha and beta, and I want to determine um, this function n of beta of d for large d. And we already see a very satisfying answer if even if we only care about the asymptotics, whenever beta is equal to minus alpha, the limit is given by this uh, spectral radius order. Uh, and of course, the next question is to generalize this uh, for spherical two distance sets with parameters alpha and beta. So let's take a look at the situation again. And I want to phrase, you know, the problem in terms of graphs. So again, I'm given a set of vectors in RD, they are unit vectors. pairwise inner product is either alpha or beta. Again, gram matrix uh, is PSD and the rank of the gram matrix is at most D. Okay. To formulate a graph, it's the same process, except that here, you know, again, the vertices you know, adjust the points, but we connect two vertices whenever the inner product is the uh, smaller uh, parameter. So beta is negative. So whenever you have inner product being a negative number, you connect them. Okay. And now I want to formulate uh, the conditions on the graph matrix in terms of the adjacency matrix of a graph of this graph. So again, I get two kinds of conditions. One is the PSD condition where lambda I minus adjacency matrix of G plus this time is some parameter times J mu J. I will tell you what J is. And this matrix has to be a PSD matrix. And here, lambda is defined to be one minus alpha over alpha minus beta, right? the mysterious parameter that we see over and over again. And uh, here's another mysterious uh, parameter, mu. It's alpha over alpha minus beta. And the rank condition uh, is the following, so the rank of the same matrix lambda i minus a g plus mu j is at most d. And the goal is again, you know, given lambda mu d, we want to find 
largest angle vertex graph G that it satisfies the two conditions, the PSD condition and the rank condition. Okay. Um, so here they are again, uh, this is our goal. And I want to tell you the story that now, you know, the game is about sign graphs. Okay. So somehow, you know, for equal angle lines, you only need to consider graphs, but we suspect that there are a lot of evidence that you know, sign graphs are highly connected to spherical uh, two-distance set. So just to record what a sign graph is, it's uh, you know the typical graph you like and love, but then now you can assign positive um, uh, negative weights uh, to, to the edges. So the edges either have weight one or negative one. And in order to draw them, whenever uh, an edge receives um, weight minus one, you uh, use this dotted line uh, to draw them. Okay, so here is a picture of a sign graph where the weights here are, for the solid lines, they are positive ones. Okay, and for the other, they are negative ones. And uh, of course, I can talk about adjacency matrix of this weighted graph. And uh, the adjacency matrix of sine graphs looks like the following. So the off diagonals could be plus minus one or zero. So they record the weights, uh, whether being positive or negative. And the largest eigenvalue again is, is the largest eigenvalue uh, of the adjacency matrix. And here's another notion that's highly connected to a um, uh, spherical two distance set. It's called a T coloring. So valid T coloring uh, of a sine graph is a coloring of, a vert of the vertices Uh, using only T colors such that the vertices of, uh, of a plus edge, of the positive edge, are color the same. And uh, the negative edges the vertices, the two vertices of a uh, negative edge uh, are colored differently. Okay. So here's an example. Um, roughly speaking, you know, you want to partition the vertices into groups such that within the same group, you see only positive edges. And between different two groups, you only see negative edges. So sort of, you know, when it's this kind of notion is introduced in the first place, they try to model some social groups, right? Within each group, they are friends. So, you know, the edges are positive and between the groups, they are enemies, maybe, then the, the edges are assigned negatively. So here, you know, I can partition the vertices into three groups and the color them with three colors. And as you can see that indeed it's the case that within the group, uh, there are solid edges and between the group there are dashed edges. Okay, and the chromatic number of the sine graph is Uh, the smallest uh, t such that there exists a valid t coloring. 
of uh, the sine graph. Okay. okay, so here are some uh, something you can do, and uh, now you can actually do very similar construction that we uh, I did before with some. List. Um, by sense that I'm a bit short on time. So maybe let me skip that and just tell you what kind of um, generalization of K of lambda uh, would be uh, in this case, given you know, the, this notion of uh, sign graphs. Okay. So the generalization for spherical two distance set is the following. It's K of lambda, but with this new parameter P and it's the infimum of all the such quotients. You know, you search for all sine graphs and uh, you know, the numerator is the, is the number of vertices in the sine graphs. And divided by the multiplicity of the largest eigenvalue of, uh, of, of this sine graph. Okay, so here, you know, um, the largest eigenvalue is equal to lambda. And I want to know the multiplicity of this large, largest eigenvalue lambda in F G and the, use it as the denominator of the, of the quotient. And also I want the chromatic number of my sine graph to be not so large. Okay. At most P. Let me just remark here that if P is at most one or two, one can actually show that this case of P of lambda is the same as K of lambda, the spectral radius order. So indeed, when P is larger, you know, it could be different from K of lambda, thus it's a generalization with this new parameter P. So the construction, a very similar construction will tell you actually our function will be at least k sub p of lambda times d over k p of lambda minus one plus little o of d. Okay. So actually using this new notion of uh, spatial radius order, but for sine graphs, you can actually cook up some constructions that gives a uh, spherical to the distance set. And the conjecture is that the reverse inequality. Holds. Uh, okay. And we have a lot of evidence that backs up this uh, conjecture. Um, namely for, for example, when alpha is a uh, beta is equal to minus alpha, of course, that's the case for equiangular lines, our lambda is equal to one minus alpha uh, over two alpha. And I forgot to mention that this new parameter T will be given by you know, one over mu rounded down. So in this case, P is actually equal to two. K of lambda is actually, KP of lambda is actually equal to K of lambda. And also, you know, it has been verified that this is indeed the case that the function behaves uh, linearly with this coefficient. And also we can show that when alpha plus two beta is less than zero, okay, and in this case, lambda is equal to this, P is at least at most two. And I just mentioned that when P is at most two, this parameter is K of lambda. And in that case, indeed, we can show that uh, the conjecture. Okay. So these two cases, you can think of it as, think of them as equiangular line-ish. Although, you know, the first case, of course, is equiangular line case, but second case, it's quite similar to equiangular case. Okay. And also we can show a couple of uh, sporadic uh, instances of the conjecture. 
namely when lambda is equal to one and the p is at least three, in this case, we can show that this kp lambda is indeed equal to p and the conjecture holds. And also when lambda is root two, root three, we can also settle all these questions. So when p is at least three, in this case, kp of lambda is equal to two. And uh, here I get two d. And when it's three, I have seven over three, and that's seven over four times d. And uh, here for p at least four, this kp lambda can be determined to be two, and the answer here is two d. Um, so I, I think, you know, there are still many questions open here. For example, can the most general question is that, can you actually show this conjecture? And even maybe the next interesting case would be, you know, what happens when lambda is equal to two and you vary this parameter P from, you know, three to uh, three, four, et cetera. And can you show that actually the conjecture holds? And uh, I think I will stop here. Thanks very much, Salen. Mm -hmm. So everyone has a little reactions button at the bottom. And if you click on that, there are ever more things you can, you can, ways you can react, but I suggest clap, um, but you know, whatever you want. Um, so, okay. Thanks again, Zalyn, and uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions.